Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance and more, and GEICO is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com or contact your local agent today. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Monday edition of The Yard. A little bit later recording that I wanted to be. Had a lot going on. You know how it is. Life on life's terms. Business stuff to do. Kid stuff to do. Finally carved out a little time to get this knocked out for you guys. Pretty decent weekend for us. We did kind of the minimum standard. You know what I'm saying? It's like we knew we had to go 3-1 and one last week. We did. We really wanted to go 4-0. Oh, and Couldn't quite pull that off actually got some help around the league too so you know that's the thing that we need to see you know we need to see split series everywhere unless somebody's playing Ole Miss and you always want those guys to sweep I mean that's just I mean are we even rivals you know what I'm saying if if we don't see it otherwise Uh, but we did get some help around the league pretty much got maybe a perfect weekend in many respects other than we didn't sweep you know, if we had swept, we could really have kind of picked up some ground and even surpassed some teams. We're right there second in the West, but, I mean, goodness, it's just two weekends in. There's nobody that should be beating their chest about the standings at this point. There's still a lot of baseball left to be played. So we're going to break down the weekend. We're going to look ahead to Memphis and take a look around the SEC and kind of see who did what and how that impacts Mississippi State. But, uh, again, I was pleased with some things, and then, you know, there's some – recurring issues you know with the bullpen I mean you know here we are you know it's about to be April 1st and we're still trying to settle those bullpen roles that was something we've talked about really since we left Omaha is that if we move Landon Sims to a starting role and now he's lost for the season you know who handles the back end for us that is still a work in progress you've had some guys kind of step up of course Brooks Auger I think has done a decent job for us Brandon Smith's been good at times now, uh, Jackson Fristo has had some good innings and then didn't have a real good weekend. Got the win in a game and, uh, you know, really didn't pitch well. And so he has all the talent. We just got to figure this thing out. And so that's really the thing. And, that, and I'm afraid that is going to be an issue all year. We need somebody, whether it be Casey Hunt, to come back or one of these younger guys to step up and kind of take ownership of that middle relief to long relief role. We're just not quite there yet. And it is frustrating. Like all of you, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, everything is great, one, two out of three. Every SEC game matters. They, they don't count how many series you won. They count how many games you won. And so, yeah, you win two out of three here, two out of three there. Yeah, that's great. But at the end of the year, you're looking back and you could have done better. So we need to win every single game. We can't just be satisfied winning the series. we got to find a way to go get the Sunday game, and we didn't do it. And, uh, you know, that's something we've got to figure out as we get into a very, very busy week. We're on the road all week. As you guys are aware, we're at Memphis tomorrow, and then we'll be at Fayetteville this weekend. And that is a trip that we have kind of learned to loathe, right? I mean, used two years ago, it's it's just another weekend. Arkansas is a really, really good baseball program. Not quite as good as us over the course of a season, but they have been really good in some weekends against us. I mean, you can tell Dave Van Horn kind of sees Mississippi State as a measuring stick. They are always up to play us. So we're going to have to get out there and play well. And I'll be honest with you, if we can go two and two this week, I think, again, that's kind of the minimum standard. we got to at least go two and two. got to beat Memphis and at least get one out in Fayetteville. We'd like to win that series, obviously. I mean, surely, ideally, you'd like to win them all. But the reality of it is it's going to be very difficult to go into Fayetteville and win the series. Now, they have not been particularly strong on Sunday, so maybe we have a chance, and we'll preview that series uh, later in the week. But uh, heading into this thing, I think if you go 2-2, two and two, you kind of hold serve. You go 3-1, and one, you're gaining ground. You go 1-3, and three, it really, really, really is a big loss this early in the year. And I, I know we can say, Steve, we still got a bunch of weekends left. All that's true. You know, but the chances of uh, of picking up sweeps in the SEC are pretty slim. They just are. I mean, you, you see it. I mean, you kind of saw what happened in Alabama this weekend, too. I mean, it's like I'm sure their goal is thinking, hey, let's go over there and win the series. Worst case, we got to salvage one. You remember how we went to South Carolina last year? 
you kind of, you know, got some separation in those games. So you get into Saturday, and what they do is they save some bullets in the bullpen gun for Sunday to try to salvage a game. And lo and behold, they had their best relievers going on Sunday. And so it's not as simple as, okay, well, everybody's just going to be out of pitching, even though in many respects Alabama was. We just didn't take advantage of that. So there's a lot to manage, to say the least. So let's get into all that. Let's thank our good friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of the show. I love them. You love them, too. You don't love them as much as I do, though. I love going in there. I've been on the Sloppy Joe Sliders kick now for a couple months. I really like going in there and getting that for lunch. It's a good lunch portion. And you always get those fabulous fries. And I like the onion rings. I'm a bit of an onion ring connoisseur. And I like theirs. Be sure and go check them out today. But, you know, the main reason you go to Bulldog Burger Company, in addition to having great family fun or a night out with the guys or girls, is a chance to get a high-quality meal. Get a great meal at a great price. Great portions, as always. Many other people are cutting back, charging you the same amount of money, giving you less food. Not a Bulldog Burger Company. They're still doing it right. You'll be glad you went in there. Three great locations to serve you right here. University Drive in Star Vegas. Gloucester Street there in Tupelo and Lake Harbor Drive. Of course, the Ridgeland Flowood area. Anywhere in central Mississippi, you can get there. You'll be glad you did. A lot of great food. Do, a lot of great people doing a great job delivering you great food at a great price. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, let's jump into game one here. It was eventful, to say the least. Very, 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 very eventful. I didn't want it to be, but it was. You know, we knew Alabama would come in here looking to play hard, but... Um, yeah, it was important for us to get a dub. We do get a dub here. Just uh, had to really, 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 really earn it, to say the least. All right, let's jump in here, run through it real quick. Uh, Preston Johnson comes out and uh, actually you know, walks the first hitter he sees, and then we get Seidel to strike out swinging. Denton, who was their big home run guy, was really quiet on the weekend, really quiet. Grounded out to short, and then uh, Tomez strikes out swinging. And then here we are. So we get through that. You, you, you get around the leadoff walk, and it's a one, two, three inning after that. Pair of, pair of K's in there, too. Bottom of one, State has a chance. Has a chance to put up a run here. That's always the case. We didn't take advantage here. Davis grounds out to second. Cam James in singles to right center. And Hancock reaches on a fielder's choice. James takes second on an error. And then next thing you know, we have a chance again. Tanner grounds out to third. Now the um, now you got a chance, you know, to, to break it open after the Hines walk there, but you don't. Kellen Clark, K swinging, so we leave him loaded there. A real opportunity there in the first inning uh, to kind of break through there. And we talk about you know those guys at the top of the order kind of setting the table. You know, we're doing the best we can here, but the reality of it is is that uh, we still need to get the clutch. Yeah, we got some later in the ball games, and I read some things on social media, and, and I, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can. I'm, this is not me being snarky, okay? I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or be condescending or patronizing in any way. Our goal is to score every inning. And, like, I've read some things out there. Well, I don't understand. It's like the offense just takes a break on Friday nights. Well, we're just facing a better quality pitcher on Friday nights. The toughest pitcher that we generally see in a week's time is on Friday night. So it's pretty rare that you get separation in a Friday night game. It's not like we just decided to sit around and all of a sudden get motivated late. We're trying to score in the early innings, too. We just didn't do it here. And so – there are a lot of times I think I read things on social media, and again, there are a lot of people that follow baseball that don't know baseball, but this is pretty basic. We're not trying to just, you know, wait till they score before we get going. We are, we're trying to score 10 runs every inning. It just doesn't always work out. Baseball is a difficult game. All right, Alabama top of second. Diodante walks. I really like him a lot, too. I know he DHs for them. I'm eager to see what he does in the minors. That guy's got a really nice stroke. Uh, and then Pickney strikes out swinging. So Williamson against the shift. He sees the shift. He's a left-handed hitter. We've got the shift on. He lays a bunt down third baseline. Works out pretty well for him, except for Preston Johnson's like, nah, I got this. Back-to-back case swingings, including Edwin on three pitches. 
And I like a guy that doesn't mess around out there. You know, sometimes we, uh, we, we, we have a waste pitch to see if we can get somebody to chase a little bit. But uh, this time we did, and we go right at him. Bottom of second, State does come through. And, again, it's, we get the leadoff hitter on. Cumba singles to left. Jaeger K swinging after a pretty lengthy at bat there. Leggett flies out the right, and then Jess Davis dumps a double down the right field line. Brad comes around to score. It's a one nothing ball game. That ball actually rattled around the bullpen a little bit. And then Cam James grounds out the first on assisted. But it's one nothing, and Jess Davis comes through there with a nice two-out hit for us. Two-out RBIs win ball games. Top of third, Jarvis flies out to center, then Seidel doubles down the line and left, but we get around it, a fly out to center to runner holds, and then Tamez flies out to left center. And I really like Tamez, too. I think he is a really good receiver. Pretty decent offensive player, too, but uh, really impressed with his ability to receive and kind of steal strikes for his pitchers. All right, bottom of third, we go, we go to bats and one at the ball game. Luke grounds out to the pitcher. Tanner pops up to second base. Then Hines doubles to right field. Hunter Hines, I even checked this, too, guys. Uh, Hunter Hines has uh, currently got eight home runs. We'll talk about one of them later. The freshman record is 18 by Rafael Palmero in 1983. Clark is then hit by the pitch, so we've got him on the shelf here a little bit. We got we got a chance here. You got runners at first and second, a runner in scoring position with two outs, and uh, Brad flies out to left field. You know, base hit there gives you some cushion. We didn't get it. Top of four, and we kind of put ourselves in some trouble here. Again, the leadoff hitter is on. We walked the leadoff hitter, Diodotti, walked him. Pingney then singles through the left side. They got runners at first and second. There's a fly out to center and the runners hold. And then Rose comes through and doubles down the left field line, which scores a run. Now there's runners at second and third with less than two outs. Eblin then grounds out to the catcher, and um, they score the run. We reviewed it, too. And uh, the, it was upheld. And then uh, Jarvis triples to right center and drives in Rose, makes it a 3-1 ball game. And then Seidel is hit by the pitch. And then Denton flies out down the line. But, again, a lot of self-inflicted situations here, right? You, the leadoff walk, you leave a pitch up, you get hammered, and then we hit a guy with a pitch. I mean, you know, those are the things that get you beat. That's three things that happen in one inning. And so it's no surprise you give up runs here. So now it's a 3-1 ball game. Alabama has the lead. Bottom of four, we have a chance to come right back. We get the leader, leadoff hitter on, Jaeger singles, the first pitch to left field. All right, and now we just let's move him around. Let's manufacture a run here, guys. Doesn't happen. Leggett strikes out swinging. Davis strikes out swinging. Jaeger takes second on a wild pitch. And then, again, a runner in scoring position with two outs. Kim James grounds out the short. Those things matter. And that's three, that's three opportunities now that we've had a chance to get the big base hit with a runner in scoring position with two outs. Hadn't always been very good. Now, Presto settles down here. We get a 1-2-3 inning in the fifth. Uh, Tamez flies out to left. Diodotti Cage looking on three pitches, and then Pickney grounds out to short. 3-1 ball game. Again, a chance for us. Same situation. Bottom of five, leadoff hitter gets on. Luke Hancock singles to right field. Goes to second on a wild pitch. Now we have a runner in scoring position with no outs. Surely we'll get him home. We don't. We walk on four pitches to put runners at first and second. Hunter Hines then strikes out swinging. Clark pops up to the third base, but incumbent flies out, Cumbus flies out to center field. So again, we get the first two guys on and get nothing to show for it. Great teams find a way to at least get one. We're not a great team yet. When we start doing this sort of thing, maybe we will be, but we're not, not yet. We're a good team, we're not a great team. You get runners at first and second, I know everybody says, well, why don't you lay down a bunt here? I don't think Hunter Hines has probably ever been asked to bunt a day in his life. And maybe that's a skill set we can work on, but the guy is hitting in the middle of the order for a reason. But again, another missed opportunity. Top of six, Presto again, one, two, three inning. Williamson grounds out the short. Rose pops up the short. Edwin strikes out looking. So Presto has given us a chance to stay in the ballgame. He's got to find a way to make something happen here. Jaeger then strikes out swinging, and they pull Guffey. Now, the initial report that I got, does it look like a hamstring deal? Found out later, he had a little tightness in his shoulder, and we hope it's nothing serious. Leggett strikes out swinging. Davis grounds out to second. Again, you know, Preston's keeping the game kind of where it is. We're not able to take advantage. Cam Teller comes in. We get a ground out to first, then we hit a guy. Denton then singles through the right side, one of his few hits on the weekend. Now, you got runners at first and third. Most people are going to find a way to get that run home, right? 
Tamez steps up looking to elevate something. He caves looking. And then Dio Dottie comes through with a double to right center and uh, chases in two runs. Now it's a 5-1 ball game. At this point, I think we all thought, well, this is it. Pickney didn't strike out looking. Bottom of seven, State strikes back. James flies out the right field. Hancock grounds out the short. But then we put together a little bit of a two-out rally. And Logan Tanner, I think, showing some real maturity at the plate, working account, trying to extend the inning, trying to get guys on base. A solo home run right here gets us a run closer, but it's also a bit of a rally killer. You need to have guys on base. You need to have some situations here where you put pressure on the pitcher. Not that LT is a big uh, you know, stolen base threat, but it gives the guy something else to think about. Well, then lo and behold, he walks Hunter Hines. Now you've got runners at first and second. They have to pull Guffey. Guffey, of course, had the little injury there. And you bring in uh, Dylan Ray, who is going to be a name to remember at Alabama in the years to come. On a full count, he gives up an absolute rocket to right field. It's a three-run bomb from Kellen Clark. And how many times has he done it? Guy's an incredible player. Now it's a 5-4 ball game. And I go back to that Logan Tanner at bat. If he goes up there and takes some selfish swings, this opportunity never presents itself. It's good team baseball. LT takes the walk. Hines takes the walk. Next thing you know, you get your clubber up there, and he comes through. Now it's a 1-1 ball game. Thinking, okay, here we go. Cumba strikes out swinging on three pitches. But now all of a sudden, we're back in the game. We've answered. And again, we talk about the two-out base hit. And I agree with Chris Simonis. The two-out walks were big here, too. Huge. You extend the inning, and you get your guy up. Get Kellum a chance up with guys on hitting against a pitcher in the stretch. Outstanding team baseball. Top of eight, you know, uh, Cam Tuller has been up and down for us a little bit. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think we win this game without Cam Tuller. I really don't. That's just me being honest. Comes out in the eight because what's the first thing you got to do, right, after you put up, put up a crooked number? Let's go get a one, two, three inning. That's exactly what happens. We get Williamson to K looking, swinging, excuse me. Rose grounds out to the pitcher, and then Elvin pops up to short. They didn't get the ball out of the infield. And the next thing you know, we're right back in the dugout. And again, not doing much with it, though. Jaeger pops out the first, and then uh, we, we pinch hit uh, Von Siebert for Leggett. He strikes out looking. And with, that's happened a cool, couple times, too. I like Von Siebert. Um, interesting to see how he develops. But we take too many borderline pitches on two strikes. And we at least got to foul that ball off. There have been a couple times this year where he's caved looking on balls that are borderline pitches, and you just can't do that. Uh, Davison strikes out swinging. It ends the inning there. So basically a one, two, three inning for us. We get the top of nine here. All right, so Jarvis grounds out the short. We hit Sato with a pitch, and then he takes second. Then strikes out swinging. We bring in Brandon Smith, who gives up the single to Tavez. It allows the run to score, makes it 6-4. So, again, Cam Tuller is charged with that run. But Cam Tuller, I thought, had a decent outing, especially in that eighth inning. You want to go sit him down? We did. We come back, and, and here we are, too. We, you know, we hit a guy, but, um, you know, it's a, it's, we're handing it over to, to Brandon Smith with a runner at second, two outs, or a pitch away from getting out of it in the second pitch. Is singled in the left center. Then Dio Dottie strikes out swinging. But it's a 6-4 ball game now going about on nine. Cam James then strikes out swinging, and Hancock flies out down the right field line. And we're all thinking, well, that's it. Let's go to the house. And then what happens? Logan Tanner, again, works a count for a walk. So 1-1 one, one count. Next thing you know, three consecutive balls. And Hunter Hines comes up. Gets ahead in the count and hits a three-run pitch over the wall in right field. Gives State two runs to tie the game. Now it's 6-6. Now we can walk it off and Kellum strikes out looking. I I didn't get a good look at the pitch. Um, But anything borderline, you got to find a way to get a bat on about it, foul that thing off. But again, some heroics late here at Duty Noble Field as Hunter Hines comes through. And that, those are the things, too. You look at this. This is where you build confidence. The next time that situation happens, we've already been there and done that. All right, top of 10, we bring in Brooks Auger. Outstanding effort, an 11-pitch inning for him. Pickney's hit by the pitch. And then one of the best defensive plays of the year made by Cam James, who didn't have a great weekend at Georgia defensively. Thought he played pretty well this weekend. We're charging on the bunt. And lost in translation here at times is Brooks Auger did what you want a pitcher to do. When you know they're going to bunt, 
You want to let them give you an out, but you want them to hit your pitch. You don't throw a breaking ball up there when you know a guy's going to bunt. Because, I mean, right, the, the downward motion of the, the breaking ball makes it easier to get the bunt down. I want to give him a ball that's in the upper part of the strike zone knowing he's going to bunt. Is there a chance that he may line it right back to me or pop it up? That's exactly what happened. So Brooks Auger gets a gold star on the wall up here. And Cam James is charging hard from third. He lays out, makes the play, and then Pickney is just completely, completely out of it. A throw from the knee, a strike to first, and you could see the emotion in our kids at that point. It was just a matter of what the final score was going to be. The game was over. Rose singles to center field, which makes that play all the more important. If he singles to center field with a runner at second, Alabama's probably got the lead here. And then Evelyn strikes out swinging. Kumba strikes out swinging and uh, runs out the first to throw him out. And then Jaeger, the very first pitch of the bat, hits a home run to right center. And uh, the emotion that he showed coming around the bases uh, was important to me. Absolutely important to me. I, I think, it, again, it shows RJ is one of us now. You know, he, he's been on the team. He's made some plays. But to hit one out, to win a game at Dirty Noble Field like that, that's a memory to last him and a lot of other people for a long time. So let's go ahead and award our prime strength player of the game. I would go with RJ, but I'm not. I'm going with Hunter Hines. I'll give a tip of the cap to Logan Tanner, too, for a couple of big ABs there for extending the ending and moving the lineup forward. But Hunter Hines steps in there and absolutely hits an absolute tank to basically save the day. I really appreciate his efforts. And uh, you'll appreciate the efforts of PrimeShrimp.com. Be sure and check them out. PrimeShrimp.com will bring wonderful New Orleans-based Prime Shrimp products direct to your front door. They've been peeling shrimp in New Orleans since the 1940s. Proud to debut exciting new products all the time. You get to serve restaurant-quality shrimp at your home in under 10 minutes. Well, Steve, how is that possible? Well, you don't get the usual fuss and preparation of this. You don't have to peel them. You don't have to devein them. You don't have to do any of that. All you do is you boil your water for 10 minutes, you open up that pouch of shrimp, you dump them in, you come back later, they're done. Done. How easy is that? Nothing's easier. Probably the easiest way to prepare shrimp is through primeshrimp.com. Be sure and check them out today. That's primeshrimp.com. Promo code BONEYARD to save a few bucks on that first order. And it's risk-free purchase. If you don't love it, you get your money back. Free shipping on all orders over four pounds or more. Outstanding. Yeah, you get the, the taste of uh, the taste of the French Quarter right in your own house for under 10 minutes. What's better than that? All right, let's get into game two. What could be better than game one? Well, game two was. You probably weren't expecting that, but you would be wrong. Game two, an even more dramatic comeback than game one. It's true. It's true. All right, so uh, your starting pitchers you know, didn't factor in the decision here. Felt both guys actually you know, had, had a decent ball game. I thought Parker Stinnett actually pitched pretty well. We, we didn't give him a lot. Uh, to work with and then when it you know when it went down it went down but he gave us five strong innings they kind of got to him there in the sixth but I think we're seeing this guy grow up a little bit I mean I, I really do I, I think he has become a guy that you can really dep- depend on Jacob McNary uh, I thought did a good job for them too he goes five innings and then Parker pitches into the sixth and uh, they do get to him a little bit there but um, again I think this starting rotation is really settling all right so let's jump into this here first thing again we walk Jarvis Jim Jarvis, a veteran player at Alabama, not going to give you a lot, not going to make a lot of mistakes. But just like we saw at Georgia, Parker Stinnett, the first guy gets on, what does he do? He rolls up a ground ball. We get the ground ball here, get him out of there, and they bunt, and it's a single, and uh, he decides to decides to go and gets picked off. Kind of silliness there. Thanks, Zane, for the contribution. And if you'd have forgotten Zane Denton, he is the guy that ran into Kellum Clark last year in Tuscaloosa and got that ridiculous – ridiculous, ridiculous runner interference call. Should have been obstruction on Denton. Stupid. All right, that's behind us now. Uh, bottom of one, Stake immediately goes to work here. We double down the line, get a ground rule double as the ball bounces into the bullpen. So now you've got a runner in scoring position with nobody out. We're going to get him around, right? No, we do not. Strike out, swing in, ground out to first. And then Davis takes third there, and then LT flies out to center. So you got two, three, four up there, and uh, we don't get a productive out. So as a result, the runner is stranded. 
Stinnett comes back, no drama here in the second, gets a one, two, three inning, gets Dio Dottie to ground out the second. Tomez strikes out swinging. Williamson strikes out swinging. We're back in the dugout. Bottom of second, Hines uh, grounds out the first. A lot of ground out the first. We rolled, our lefties rolled over a lot of baseballs this day. Hancock strikes out swinging. Compaston singles through the left side, and then Jaeger strikes out swinging. So not much going on against McNary. Top of three. Again, Parker Stinnett, a one, two, three inning. Pigney grounds out the short. Eblin grounds out the short. Rose lines out the short. Nice play by Lane Forsyth here. Kind of a soft liner out there. He lays out and makes a grab. It's the Lane Forsyth inning there. And, again, I'll, I'll continue to argue with you guys if you want to. There is no argument to make. Lane Forsyth is an elite defender. Bottom of third, and it's just how it works, right? You make all those great defensive plays. You come out, and then Lane Forsyth grounds out to third. Davison grounds out to first. Cam James singles to the right side after a lengthy bat there. And then um, Calum Clark, who was hitting in the three-hole, which I do not agree with. I'm glad we moved him back down. He's going to see way too many breaking balls there. Uh, Clark grounds out to short uh, to end the inning. A lot of first pitch swinging from Kellen Clark there in the three-hole. All right, top of four. Parker Stinnett kind of quietly putting together a really good inning here. Uh, another outing. Uh, he retires, what, 10 in a row at this point? That's right. Yeah, one, two, three inning. Strikeout swinging of Jarvis, strikeout looking of Seidel, and then Denton pops up to the shortstop. So, again, Parker Stinnett holding the game right where it is. Bottom of four, another good opportunity for us here. LT is hit by the pitch. Hines grounds out to second. There is no play to be made here. Uh, at second, and then uh, Hancock homers down the right field line. How good is that to see? That's really, really good to see. Luke's going to get going. Uh, and then Kumba strikes out swinging. Jaeger strikes out swinging. So a good inning could have been a bigger inning. We'll take the two runs and feel pretty good about life. All right, 2-0, and oh, and Stanette doing an outstanding job here. They finally snapped the streak of 10 consecutive retired, and it's us. We walk him on four pitches, Diodati. Another guy with a big stick that lets you walk him. But rather than, you know, relent to the negativity here, we compose ourselves and we get one, two, three strikeouts in a row swinging. Tomez, Williamson, Pickney, all strikes out. Strand the runner uh, there at second. He did advance on a wild pitch. But, um, you know, again, another good inning from Parker Sinat. Bottom of five, another chance for us to tack on uh, uh, to the lead here, another run here to, to pad the lead. Lane Forsyth singles to the right side. Another lengthy at bat there. I do think the kid's getting getting better at the plate. Davison strikes out swinging. And then Cam James doubles down the left field line. Forsyth to third. Niners runners at second, third, less than two outs. You got to think, let's just elevate a ball somewhere. And we'll, you know, we'll get a run home full of a better about life. Nope, we don't get the ball out of the infield the next two at bats. Kellen Clark strikes out swinging on three pitches. And then uh, Logan Tanner grounds out to third. So, again, two very important runs in the middle part of a ball game, a chance for us to remove any possibility of just somebody running into one and making it a ball game. We don't get the hit. All right, top of six, Alabama finally finally gets to Parkerson net. He gives up a single back up the middle, then gets a K swinging. There is a fielder's choice. I think we probably could have turned two here. I think. I think. We didn't try it, though. We forced the runner at second. We don't turn it at first. Then there's a wild pitch. We get the single. The run comes around and scores a 2-1 ball game. Then Denton doubles to right center. It's a tie ball game. Diodati walks again. Then Tomez singles through the left side. And then Denton scores. Now it's a 3-2 Alabama lead. And we bring in Pico uh, in place of Stinnett. You go back and you look at all that stuff. There's all, this the game within the game. We're able to turn that double play. Nothing else afterwards ha- even happens. And Parker Stinnett gets six innings. Didn't work out. We end up pulling Pico uh, in for Stinnett, and then Williamson strikes out looking. And that's it. If you, this is the crazy one, too, if you recall. Williamson stuck his leg out and uh, hit the ball with his knee. Thought it would be a HBP. It wasn't. They review it. And our, our catcher, Logan Tanner, immediately all over it. He leans in. I want to say his knee was across the wide. He may have been out of the batter's box, but um, he did lean in with the knee. They review it, and he is out, which ends the inning. If not, it would have been bases loaded right there with two down, with a freshman on the mound. All right, bottom of six, they bring in uh, Jake Leger. I think uh, Leger is how we pronounce it, where I'm from. Uh, Hines reaches on a fielding error at second. 
And I thought their second baseman had some trouble all weekend. Uh, Hancock is then hit by the pitch. Now we got runners at first and second, a chance for us to at least tie the ball game. Cumbus flies out the right. Runners have to hold. Jaeger then singles back up the middle. Hines scores. Hancock takes second. It's a tie ball game. And then Forsyth grounds into a double play. Uh, that's one thing we got to get better at. It seems like there's a lot of times that it's either Brad Cumbus or Lane Forsyth uh, rolled into double plays. Not that we've had a whole lot of them, but we've had enough that it's, uh, it's something you got to think about. All right, now it's a 3-3 ball game. Pete goes in the game, and you've, he's probably been our most reliable younger pitcher this year. Gives up a home run the deep center field. Now it's a 4-3 Alabama lead. When we get a ground out, we walk a guy. We get Jarvis to fly out, and Seidel grounds out the short. The inning's over, but we have surrendered the lead once again. Bottom of seven, State needs to answer. We don't. And, again, we've got the top of the order up. Jess strikes out swinging. Jams grounds out the short, and then Kellum Clark strikes out swinging. The, the Kellum Clark in a three-hole spot for this year, that needs, that's, that needs to be over. All right, Alabama top of eight. Then grounds out to third. Diodati's hit by the pitch. Tamez pops up to first base, and then Williamson grounds out to second. So they strand the runner there. The hit by pitch doesn't hurt us, but we got to keep giving – got to stop giving free bases away. All right, bottom of eight. State does a good job here, and uh, they bring in Furtado. A little more velo from him. Tanner grounds out the short. Then Hines singles to the right side. Now you've got the tying run on base. We pinch hit, uh, excuse me, pinch run Braywood Skinner for Hines. And then Hancock reaches on a fielding error. We hit it through the second baseman again. And then there's runners on the corner. Cumba strikes out swinging. Again, this is a situation here. How many times in our career have we thought, hey, oh, good, Brad's up, right? We, the guy has earned our, our trust and our confidence. We expect him to come through here. In this situation, he didn't. Runners on the corners in a one-run ball game, you just need something you can elevate. He strikes out swinging. Hancock then uh, goes to second, and Skinner scores on the wild pitch. So they kind of gift us the run here. Jaeger is then walked, and uh, Siebert singles, and now all of a sudden the bases are loaded. You got a chance now, you think, okay, we just punch one across here. We just got to get three outs, and we're, we're in the house with another dub. Slate offered uh, grounds out the second, though he pinch hit for Jess Davis. Lengthy at bat there, for sure. Now, I still think Slate offered is going to be a dude at Mississippi State. But again, a chance for a big inning ends up with just being a one run inning, and that run scores on a wild pitch. We, we did not get the big hit in the inning. All right, top of nine. This is where things get a little hairy for us. Pickney doubles to right center, so immediately Alabama gets a go-ahead go run on the very, the very first hitter. Evelyn strikes out swinging, then Rose, Caden Rose doubles down the right field line. The run is in. Then Jarvis singles up the center. Another run is in. Seidel doubles to right center. Another run is in. It is now 7-4. Denton strikes out swinging. Diodati grounds out to first. And now Fristo, of course, is your pitcher. Has allowed three runs in the inning. Ends up being your winning pitcher because Mississippi State finds a way here in the bottom of nine. Cam James doubles down the left field line. It's a ground rule double. And you start thinking, okay, maybe we got a chance. Well, then Kellum doubles to left center, and then Cam scores. Now it's 7-5. Now the tying runs at the plate, and there's no runs out. It's exactly what happened. Logan Tanner Hits one just over the fence and left. And as he joked with me post game in the box score, it looks like a 500 foot smash. And he's exactly right. And if you're the left fielder there, you got to try to make that play. Because with nobody out in the inning, if you play that ball off the way, uh, off the wall, you're basically conceding the run that makes it 7 6. And you know it's going to at least be a double. And again, nobody's out. You got to try to make that play. And at the very least, for, force Clark to tag and take third. Um, or excuse yeah. And so he tries, gets lost out there, the ball gets over his head and over the fence. And uh, not a great effort there, but he's kind of caught in between. But you've got to make a play on the baseball there. He doesn't. It's 7-7. All right, so they bring in Hunter Hoops to pitch, and uh, he is uh, very unorthodox in his delivery, a lot of breaking stuff, kind of a side armor at times, alternates arm slots. And so he gets Matt Quarter to ground out to second. And Luke Hancock walks. Cumbus singles down the line and left. Really hit that baseball well, too. Niners runners at first and second. Got a chance to make this thing happen here. Jaeger grounds out to the pitcher unassisted. Basically works just like a bunt here. He kind of capped it, and it rolls along the right side there, and uh, basically just like a bunt. Now all of a sudden you got runners at second and third, 
And Tanner Leggett, Tanner Legend, with two outs, comes through and rips it in left field, and then uh, Hancock scores, and we're walk-off winners, again, for the second straight night. So State with four in the night. Now, here's the thing that I'll say, too, about all of this. I have read with great interest some people that have said, well, Alabama blew it. No, Alabama didn't blow it. Mississippi State won it. It'd be one thing if they walked the bases loaded, and then all of a sudden somebody drops the ball in the outfield. No. You start out back-to-back doubles and a home run. All right, that's winning the game. That's not somebody blowing it. They're throwing pitches, the same pitches that got us out the previous inning. Matter of fact, we're the same pitcher. And we're knocking this guy around the yard. And then they change pitchers and bring in somebody fresh. We get a ground out. We do get one walk in the inning, and then there's two singles to go. We won the game. Alabama didn't give us the game. We won it. Big difference. I think it's important for people to understand the distinction. Now, they gifted us a run earlier in the ball game on a wild pitch. We won it in the ninth. We absolutely did. Let's take some time now to do our top ten list, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. Blair's been a longtime friend of mine. He'll be a friend of yours, too, and he is a friend in the industry. That is the mortgage industry. Very, very complicated, very, very complicated issue sometimes. You know, it's like you have to get so many things to get it taken care of. It doesn't always work out. It pays to have a mortgage professional. There are a lot of people out there working for your business. Blair's a guy that absolutely deserves it. 21 years of industry experience, top 1% close ratio nationally. It's a guy that gets things done. Works at Fairway Mortgage, recently voted number one in customer satisfaction and mortgage lending. So you got the best guy from the best company. If you're looking to refi, now's a great time to do it. Get your equity working for you. Consolidate some debt. Lower your overall monthly payment. There's no point you going to bed each night wondering, am I going to make it to Friday? Now when you've got equity available to work with. Maybe you're looking to, you know, maybe you're looking to avoid foreclosure. Maybe you're looking to buy a home. There's anything that's got to do with the mortgage industry, Blair Chandler can help you with it. He's a professional at it. Let me give you Blair's information. Go to closewithblair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R. And better yet, let me give you his phone number. How about that? Now, I've had a couple of you at times that have said, hey, Steve, I didn't write the number down. Can you send it to me? I'm happy to do it. But here it is. It's 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. And here's the deal. Here's some incentive just by being a loyal Boneyard listener. If you mention to Blair that you heard about him on the Boneyard, he will pay for your appraisal. It's about a $500 value. A lot of fees associated with getting a mortgage loan approved. He's going to save you some, some, some jack there. Be glad you did. Trying to keep it in the family. Again, that's closeofblair.com and mention that you heard about him on the Boneyard to get your free appraisal. All right, we had uh, some bad news over the weekend. You guys know Dave Nickel passed away, former Mississippi State inside receivers coach. I won't get into a lot of detail. I've, I've heard a few things. But basically, when he got out there to USC, it wasn't long after that. He found out that he was sick. And um, I understand he told him he had about a year to live. And uh, Lincoln Riley is like was like a brother to Dave, and USC was kind of his dream job and to kind of reunite with Lincoln. So I'm glad Dave had the opportunity to do that. Uh, but he has gone. There are a lot of people in Starkville, Mississippi, that are absolutely heartbroken over this. Uh, corresponded with Mike Leach a little bit after it all took place, and uh, Coach Leach said he's known him, I think, 22 years. Hired him as a student assistant at Texas Tech and has been with him pretty much throughout his career. And uh, he is a leech guy. And so there are some people that you care about uh, that are certainly hurting today. And so thoughts and prayers to everybody that knew and loved Dave Nickel. May he rest in peace. And then just as we're kind of dealing with that, I get home after the ball game Friday night and uh, find out that um, Taylor Hawkins has died. From the Foo Fighters. My daughter Audrey texts me and she's like, Daddy, Taylor Hawkins is dead. Well, what's happened? And there are a few things I want to say about this before we get to today's top 10 list in honor of Taylor Hawkins. You know where we're going here. It's Foo Fighters, even though he didn't play on the first two Foo Fighters albums. He played these songs every night. So we're going to honor his memory with some Foo Fighters, a top 10 Foo Fighters album, my favorite song off each of those albums. Now, Taylor Hawkins, the toxicology report has come back and it's not good. It was kind of what I feared. You know, it's one of those things you hate to hear about. There are times that I have been told, though, in recent years that uh, Taylor was, you know, working some recovery stuff and trying to kind of get all the stuff behind him. 
And the thing that I go back to, and like I, I've read some things on social media, and that it brings out the best and worst in people. It really does. This guy said, well, you know, another, another drug-addicted rock star gone. You know, and um, that's a little crass. It might be true, but it's a little crass. And so the thing that I think about, and maybe it's because I've worked a program of recovery for over 30 years, is I just think to myself is what in the world could be wrong in Taylor Hawkins' life? You know, I can't begin to imagine you got, you know, tens of thousands of people turn it out every night to hear you play your music. You love music. He's always so energetic. You get to play every night with your best friend, Dave Grohl. What in the world was going on in his life that he felt like this is what he needed to do? I had heard years ago that he he had battled, uh, you know, a pain pill addiction, you know, all these years of touring, getting older and trying to perform at a high level that he had dealt with some of that. And you find out he had... 10 different substances if that report is to be believed and a lot of people say well you know he should have known better you know maybe he should he's still dead either way it could have been prevented and those are the things that i think about there's so much stigma still attached with all this stuff too it's like you know what in the world what in the world could he have been so sad down and depressed about that he felt like this is what he had to do to live and to function and here's the thing that i think is an important if you don't hear anything else i say today listen to this There are a lot of people out there, earth people we call them, uh, a lot of earth people out there that think all of this is just recreational use. It's like, oh, they just want extra fun. Life's not enough for them, so they got to do this and do that, and they want to live recklessly. I can tell you as a former drug addict, and I guess I'll always be a drug addict, I'm just not a practicing drug addict, is it is not that simple. It may start out as extra fun, and then it becomes kind of part of living. As some of you people like to go have a cup of coffee to start your day. There are other people that, uh, that use medicinal purposes. And it's easy to look down on those people. I was one of them, and I can tell you that that doesn't help anything. Uh, it doesn't make you a better person in any way whatsoever to, to hold judgment on these kinds of people. And so I share that with you because I am, uh, I'm heartbroken for Taylor Hawkins and the Foo Fighters family and everybody that loved the Foo Fighters. And you can say, well, Steve, they'll carry on. Yes, they will. But the people that were the closest to him will never be the same. That's one thing that I would do too. If you, if you were one of those people that is kind of battling addiction out there, if you're kind of wandering in the abyss, think about the people around you. You think they don't care. They do. They do. They may not always show it. They may get frustrated with you at times, but they care. They care. I got some people in my life, you know, they're alcoholics and, uh, and work at times with, with chemical dependency stuff. And it wears me out sometimes. It does. It absolutely wears me out. You know, sometimes somebody gets drunk and, you know, they'll call you in the middle of the night or they'll text you. And, you know, they're, they're not the nicest of people and under that condition, but you still love them and you want them to get better and you hope they get better. And that's one thing that, you know, I, I've, got some, I've got some friends of mine. It's like they just get absolutely bitter and angry and blame everybody in the world for their problems. And I just, man, man, I love you. I do. I, I want you to get better. I want you to get some help. Just tell me how I can help you. And so I think it's important to understand that there are a lot of people out here that die lost. And I don't just mean, you know, lost from a salvation standpoint. There are people that die lost in this world because they don't know that they've got anywhere to turn. And I know when I got ready to go, I was so far away from where I needed to be that any step I took was in the right direction. And I thought all these people had abandoned me, all these people that, you know, these, they were supposed to love me. I didn't think they did. I thought I was all alone in the world. And I would die alone in the world. But as soon as I reached out, they weren't even at arm's length. You know, as, as my one hand went out, I had about 100 that grabbed me and helped pull me out of that mess. And so if you're a person that's dealing with that, I can assure you, you are not alone. No matter what you tell yourself, or what that little voice in your head tells yourself. And I wish we all could have been there for Taylor Hawkins to make him know that he wasn't alone either. All right, so here we go, ranking the top 10 Foo Fighters albums, and, and uh, they had a new one come out last year, which makes this uh, 10. How about that? 10 studio albums. We'll start with number 10, uh, Off Medicine at Midnight. We're going on Waiting on a War, and I love the melodic opening to the song. It opens up very, very sweetly, and the next thing you know, it, it kind of kicks in a little bit, and you know, it just talks about loving everybody. It's like you know, I've always felt like that there was you know, something to fight for in life. It's a really good track. Number nine, my favorite one, Sonic Highway is a very interesting album. It's recorded a lot of different places, written a lot of different places, but my favorite song on that album is easily Congregation. So number nine is Congregation off Sonic Highways. 
All right, so Concrete and Gold is another really interesting album. Uh, I, I love the opening bars of this one, too. And I love how Taylor comes in with a drum and kind of counts everybody in. Next thing you know, we're off and running, which ironically, the name of the song is Run. Off Concrete and Gold, Run is your number eight song. Number seven, Wasting Light, kind of a sneaky good album. We're going the opposite direction. We're going Walk here. Walk off Wasting Light, your number seven album. Number six, Echo, Silence, Patience, and Grace. There, there are some deeper tracks on this album that weren't released as singles that probably should have been, but the headliner for me from this album is The Pretender. Absolutely love this one. It's so good sonically. It sounds great in the car. It's one of those songs, too. You know, you, you, you kind of dig into the, the meaning of it all. You know, it's, uh, it, it clears to be, uh, appears to be a relationship-type song. You know, what if I say I'm not like the others? Starts out, he's a pretender. In the end, she's a pretender. Number five, One by One. Love this album. You will, too. My favorite track, and we could have gone a couple different ways on this one. This is one of those ones that I kind of I kind of chewed on a little bit before I went with it. Some of you guys could see a little bit differently than me. You know, there, times like these is, a, uh, is kind of a Foo Fighters standard now at this point. Could have gone that direction. Could have gone with low, but instead... I went with all my life. I love, I absolutely love the track. I listened to it on the way to Dignable Field a couple times this weekend. All my life from one by one. That's your number five song on today's top ten list. Number four, if memory serves me correct, this is the final album without Taylor Hawkins. They, they recorded ten, the first two, the, the self-titled album, and the color and the shape didn't have Taylor. Uh, but I, you know, the the color and the shape in, to me is one of those um, albums that I think everybody that knows the Foo Fighters, has either had this album or downloaded this album at some point. Again, a lot of great... Bulldog fans, are you like me? Are there just not enough hours in the day? You know, I'm getting older, but I really don't want to slow down. But, uh, you know, that's the reality of life. It's a shame we got to get old. But I'm getting there, for sure. And I'm busier than I've ever been. I got book signings to do. I got shows to record. I got ball games to cover. You know, there are more demands on my time than ever. And I'll be honest with you, my energy needed to keep up sometimes wanes. That's why I take M-Drive Start. M-Drive Start is a premium protein powder packed with seven clinically tested ingredients that support energy, strength, and drive, and six premium protein sources for optimal recovery and digestion. Every year, it becomes more obvious we're getting older. That necessarily means we want to reduce our quality of life. So prioritize the need to take care of your own health. M-Drive is a supplement for every lifestyle and every stage of life. Makes it easy for guys like me and you to take care of our health. You get M-Drive start at mdriveformen.com. That's mdriveformen.com. And use coupon code BONEYARD for 10% off your first order of M-Drive. You get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's mdrive start at mdriveformen.com. Promo code BONEYARD. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance and more, and Geico is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. Stuff on this one. You know, Monkey Wrench is on this. Um, wind up is on it. My hero is on this. Walking after you is on this. It, it is a classic one, but I went with Everlong. I just like the up tempo stuff. I, I think Dave is great on this one. So number four, Everlong from the album The Color and the Shape. Number four. All right, number three off the album. There is nothing left to lose. This is a lot of people consider this the greatest Foo Fighters album. I don't, but I could I could get down with it. It won the Grammy that year. Uh, for best rock album an absolute great 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 song and and what's interesting too i dug this quote up too it's uh dave Grohl says it's all about settling into the next phase of your life that play place where you can sit back and relax because there's been so much crazy blank in the past three years at that point it was me taylor and nate and we were best friends it was one of the most relaxing times of my whole life all we did was eat 
chill, drink beer and whiskey and record whenever we felt like it. When I listen to that record, it totally brings me back to that basement. I remember how it smelled and how in the spring, so the windows were open and we'd do vocals until you could hear the birds through the microphone. And more than any other record I've ever done, this album does that to me. So a lot of people have listened to this and kind of felt that same feeling. And I could have, this is, again, you could have easily gone, this is the greatest album. Wasn't for me. It is one of my favorites, though. There are so many different songs I could have gone here. I, I love Stacked Actors. I absolutely love that song. I think it's unlike anything else in the catalog. I almost went that way. I almost went Breakout, but we didn't. We went Learn to Fly. Learn to Fly, the number three song on the Rest in Peace, Taylor Hawkins top ten list. Number two, the, the, the debut album, and people don't know this. Most people don't, I guess. Dave Grohl played everything. He did the vocals. He played guitars. He did the bass. He did the drums. He did everything, absolutely everything, on his first solo joint, I guess. And many of these songs were actually written when he was with Nirvana. And some of these he just didn't have the confidence to pitch them to the band. And so he held them. He did them himself, the Foo Fighters, and there was just one Foo, and that was Dave Grohl. Self-produced the album. It is an incredible album. There are so many things on here, too. Again, you could have went for, you know, for all the cows is kind of silly. And then, uh, you know, Big Me, this is a call. A lot of people like them. I went with I'll Stick Around. And uh, I took that in many ways as kind of like I'm moving on from Nirvana. It's done. It was a great time in my life. I'm going to stick around. I'm going to do what I love to do. 45 Minutes, Man of Absolute Glory. That's the self-titled Foo Fighters album. So you're wondering, well, Steve, what could be number one? What's in your honor? Easily to me, number one. Now, you may see it a little bit differently, but it's one of those albums, too, I think, in some respects, that maybe maybe got me back on the hook a little bit. You know, I think there are some songs on this album that are so incredibly underappreciated. There are some albums, you know, Dave is a little silly at times, and there are some songs that I'll probably skip on some albums. This is the one where I don't. I don't skip a single track. It's only 40 minutes, too. It's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, No Way Back is great. DOA is incredible. Resolve is another one. The last song is a great one. The Deepest Blues are back. That's sneaky good, too. But one of my favorite songs in the modern rock era is from this album. And it is anthemic to me. It's one of those songs that sometimes you hear and some, some, some days I cry and some days I put my fist in the air. And it's the best of you. I absolutely love the song. I think it is uh, one of the best songs written of my generation. And that, that encompasses a lot of years now. Uh, not as many years as I'd like to have, but you know when it ends, it's been a great ride. I won't complain. But there you go, number one, best of you off the End Your Honor album. So I didn't want to have to do this when we actually had another great American rock band uh, that we were going to do today. And then this happened. And uh, it just felt like the right thing to do. As soon as it happened, I text Roy and I was like, hey, I'm going to throw you a curveball Monday. He goes, yeah, I expected that. We need to do that. And we did. And I think there are a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, you think about Dave, man. It's like uh, Dave Grohl, you know, he's lost you know, two of his best friends over the years, uh, you know, prematurely for this kind of stuff. And um, it's really, really sad. And so I know Dave, uh, being a champion of life, will, will soldier on, and the Foo Fighters will as well. And so wish everybody in Foo Land the absolute best, and uh, rest in peace, uh, Taylor Hawkins. If you have ideas for the top ten list, reach out and let me know. Be glad to review them. We might even do them on the show. You can send them to me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. You can reach out to our good friend Roy Samante at Dogmatic. That's at D A W G M A T I C 67. And send them to Roy. Matter of fact, if you send them to Roy, it's probably easier. It kind of cuts me out as a middleman there. But uh, Roy keeps a pretty good detailed list for us. And uh, last week was kind of a depressing list in many ways. It's like, oh, you know, we had, oh, we lost this person for this and this person for that and their suicide. And then lo and behold, we end up losing two people that we, that we all liked an awful lot over the weekend. And uh, so hopefully we'll have some, uh, some happy stuff. So what I'm going to do on Wednesday, I'm going to come back with the top ten albums of the band I plan to do today. One of the most amazing modern rock acts out there today. We'll do them on Wednesday. Wednesday. So we plan to do them today. We'll do them on Wednesday.
Let's take some time to thank our friends from Hawthorne. Guys, I've shared with you guys before. Go to H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E.co. Listen to me. This is not just me reading an ad. I am speaking from my heart. The best cologne that I have ever had in my life is from Hawthorne. I went and took the little quiz. I answered honestly. They sent me products, and it is absolutely fabulous. Fabulous. Matter of fact, I got some more gear on the way. I can't wait for it to get here. It's going to be summertime, right? Summertime's coming up soon. Going to be sweating a little bit more. Got to put more of an effort into smelling good. Hawthorne's the way to go. H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O. And be sure to use promo code Boneyard while you're there. It is so easy to do. And I cannot recommend these products highly enough. We have pitched a lot of stuff on the show. Nothing's better than Hawthorne. Nothing. When you think about men's health and personal care, I get it all. I get the shampoo, the conditioner, the deodorant. I even get the lotion. I, I, I lotion up my arms. I got all these tattoos, and sometimes my skin gets dried out. Yeah, you got to shower sometimes and use that extra, you know, that body wash sometimes dries your skin out. I got to be moisturized. I Man, I got to look good. I, I got to smell good. And nobody keeps me more in the game than Hawthorne. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O. Dot co. Be sure and check them out today. You'll be glad you did. I'm pretty excited about getting this new gear. You should be too. Go check them out. They're with us again uh, this week. Again, check them out. It's H A W T H O R N E dot co. Promo code Boneyard. Trust me on this. You will not, and, and search the world over, you will never find a better cologne because this is tailor made for you. Absolutely tailor made. Ladies, listen to me. You will make your man do this. Everybody benefits from this. You get your significant other. If, you, if your significant other is of the male persuasion, have them sit down tonight, fill out this quiz, and you'll be glad you got it. It is an absolute game changer. Again, it's Hawthorne.co. All right, let's get to the Game 3 recap. This segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. I was there over the weekend and uh, had a chance to see Stan the Man. Looking like he's about ready to get back in the ring, man. Going back and check this week, you know, guys, uh, Stan Man fell, broke his arm, leaving uh, Duty Noble Field, broke his cheek. It was rough for a few days. Said he's feeling better. He's looking better. Uh, Stan's a great guy. Go by and check him out. Maybe uh, send him a text. Let him know you're thinking about him. He's doing great. I didn't get to see Susie or Kathy on Saturday. I guess they don't work on the weekends like some of us. But uh, happy to be back at Campus Book Mart. So many great people there doing a great job. Selling Mississippi State merch. Kind of the sugar to the sweet, right? I mean, right? We all need new Mississippi State merch. And you can also get all five of my books from them. How about that? You didn't know that. They got all five of them. There's only a few places that carry all five. They have all five. And they've got signed copies of everything. So you can get those ordered through them. And uh, let me encourage you, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And use promo code BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than 50 bucks, absolutely incomplete. All right, let's knock out this Game 3 recap, even though we probably don't want to. We have to. Again, we had our chances. Had our chances in this ball game, And that's the thing that I go back to with every bit of this. Is so much of this is about us, not the competition. It's about us. If we execute, we're going to win a lot of baseball games. We're a talented team. And, of course, experienced teams with talent execute at a higher level of proficiency. We've got some experience. We also have some young guys at key positions. But my hope is and my belief is we're going to be playing our best baseball at the end of the year. All right, Cade Smith is your starter. And my attitude about it was I was really confident. I'm like, hey, Cade Smith going into Sunday, their bullpen is kind of thin. You know, we just got to go up there and put a few runs up. We got to win this ball game. Well, the runs were not there for us. We didn't. Cade was good. Probably, maybe, maybe we stuck with him a few pitches too long. But I thought Cade gives you another another quality start. It gives you a chance to win. And he goes one, two, three in the first. A fly out, fly out, fly out. We get the top three. Uh, we're really, without a lot of trepidation there, only Denton went deep into the count. Uh, bottom of first, what do we do? Quarter is uh, – is, leading off and starting in center field. And listen, Jess has not been good against lefties, especially as of late. So you shake it up a little bit. Now, of course, that has you with two guys sitting under 200, hitting back-to-back when you get deeper in the order. So I get the criticism in that respect. But 
if Jess had been up there against these lefties, as, as salty as a couple of these guys were, you're basically giving an out away. That's just my honest opinion. I understand the move. I may have had leg hidden ninth, but I understand having quarter work the right lefty matchup. And lo and behold, what does he do? He walks opening the bats. So the leadoff runner for us is on board. Cam strikes out swing, and, and then Luke uh, reaches on a fielder's choice. They force the runner at second. And the next thing you know, LT doubles to right center. Hancock scores. It's one of the ball game. But again, a lot of this goes back to the walk. You open up with a runner, and ultimately you extend the inning. You bring LT up with a chance to uh, drive in a run with a runner on, and he does. So again, two out base hit there from LT, who I thought had a pretty good weekend. Hines then grounds out the second, but it's a one nothing lead for State. You think, hey, would Cade Smith on the mound got a good chance of me making this thing stand up? The lead did not last a half inning. We walked Iadati again, a very disciplined hitter there, and uh, he really hurt us later in this ball game. But again, we go out there and we do that, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, we allowed the leadoff hitter on four straight innings. I believe that's correct, starting with this one. We get to Madison strikeout swinging. Pigney flies out to right. So you think, okay, we're a pitch away from getting out of this. And the next thing you know, we get a single to the right side. Dio Dottie goes to second. And then Williamson singles to right field. So, so a couple of hits in the inning. And we do get a K to get out of it. So we technically strike out the um, – I guess we don't strike out the side here. We get two strikeouts in the inning. But we allow, you know, three base runners in the inning. And that usually yields a run. Bottom of second, a chance for us to uh, get the lead back again. We strike out swinging to open, and then Compass singles to third base. Just, you know, ball hit pretty – it kind of just got under a barrel and kind of rolled out there past the mound, and Brad's pretty fleet of foot once he gets down the line. And uh, so now you've got a runner on with less than two outs, and then Jaeger singles up the middle. So now all of a sudden you got some things going here. Runners at first and second, one down. Let's just put a ball in play. What we do, we actually ground into the 5-4-3 double play uh, to end the inning. A great opportunity, and we give it up on a, a twin killing here. But it's still a 1-1 ball game. Still got chances. Top of third. What do we do? We walk the leadoff hitter again, then he's still second. We get Seidel to strike out looking. We get Denton to strike out swinging. And then Dio Dottie grounds out the short. So, again, the leadoff walk doesn't come around to hurt us. Eventually, it would. Uh, quarter grounds out to first. James strikes out looking, then Hancock walks, and LT strikes out swinging. So not a really good sequence for the Bulldog offense there in the bottom of three. Uh, Alabama top of four. They take the lead on the day. Tomez singles to short, and then Peakney, and, and the single to short there, it, it was legit. It just it was a ball deep in the hole, just what anything to do there. Uh, Pickney strikes out looking, then Edlin doubles to right center. Had his best game of the weekend on Sunday against Kate Smith. And then Tomez scores, makes it a 2-1 ball game. Williamson grounds out the first, and then Rose strikes out swinging. So right out of there, it's a 2-1 deal. We got a chance to come right back. We've got our, some big guns up, but Hines rolls over a ball to first. Clark flies out the center, and then Cumbus grounds out the short. It's a 1-2-3, fairly quick inning. Cumbus there was a very competitive at bat there. Uh, made contact with all five pitches. Just fouled everything off, and then grounds out the short. Top of five. Uh, again, leadoff hitter gets on. This time, Jarvis singles his way into left. Seidel flies out to center. Didn't flies out to uh, to left. And then Dio Dotti walks again. It's like this guy is just a walk machine. And then Tomez strikes out swinging. So, again, leadoff hitter gets on. It doesn't come back to get us here. Eventually, it would. Uh, bottom of five, and we go one, two, three in the inning. Jaeger strikes out swinging. Forsyth walks. And then it's Matt Quarter doing the honors, grounding into the 5-4-3 double play. That didn't happen to us very often. It happened to us, I think, three times on the weekend. All right, Alabama top of six, and we're still hanging in there. Kate is keeping us in the ball game. Pickney grounds out the short. Edmund flies out the center. And, he's, and listen, at this point, we're around 100 pitches, and Kate's still pumping in there mid-90s. He has Williamson struck out, and we don't get the call. He fouls the next pitch off, and then he hits a home run to right field to make it a 3-1 ball game. I get it umpires are human that was an inexplicable call we were if he makes the right call there we're out of the inning in a one-run ball game but instead we give up a tank and he absolutely murdered that pitch a tip of the cap to him all right bottom of six against eight a chance here 
and we can't get the big two out base hit. James grounds out to short. Hancock flies out to left. LT then singles the first pitch through the left side. Hines walks. Now, all of a sudden, first and second, Tyne runs her aboard. Kellum Clark flies out to left center. It's part of baseball, but again, we've got to find a way to get more of these two out base hits. Two out, two out base hits win you games. Brooks Auger comes in to pitch for Smith here. Gets a really good inning here. We get a ground out the short to open. We walk side L, and then we get Denton to ground into a double play. And uh, so we're out of there. You know, we face some minimum. We do give up the walk there, but it doesn't come back to get us. Bottom of seven, they bring in Antoine Jean to pitch for a hit. And then Cumbus flies out down the line at right. Hit it pretty well. Uh, Jaeger then grounds out to third. And again, a chance for a two-out rally. We actually – have a chance here to really blow this game open. It doesn't work out for us. Uh, Forsyth does a good job with a nice two-out base knock. Quarter follows through, pulls the ball to the left side. Now, all of a sudden, it's first and second. Tyne runs her on base. Kim James, your leading hitter, comes up. He hits the ball back towards the middle, and uh, the shortstop can't handle it. It is an E6 there. So now the bases are loaded with two outs. Luke is coming up. You know, he's already hit a home run on the weekend. He's actually struck some balls well. And so you're thinking, you know what? I don't know that this isn't the guy that I would want up here in this situation. Not going to strike out. And lo and behold, they hit him with the pitch. It's almost like walking, you know, I don't want to get too carried away. But you remember when Barry Bonds would come up and they'd walk him sometimes, even with the bases loaded? That's kind of how it felt. I would rather have seen Luke swing here. And that's not in any way throwing shade at LT. I just felt like Luke was on it. It was hitting the baseball pretty well. And even though it's a lefty-lefty deal, I thought, you know what? Luke's going to come in here, and lo and behold, they hit him. Now it's a 3-2 ball game, and all the pressure's on them. And then LT strikes out looking on three pitches. You know, there are moments that come up to make it your team, like when LT hit the home run on Saturday. These are those kinds of moments. And in order for us to get through what we want as a team, collectively, we've got to – when ducks are on the pond, we've got to make this thing happen. State never seriously threatened the rest of the baseball game. Top of eight, Diodati grounds out to second. Tomez strikes out looking. Pickney walks. And then Edwin strikes out swinging. You know, just kind of part of the deal here. And so, Augur's rolling along here. You know, we talk about trying to find you know, some consistency in the bullpen. And Augur, you know, put together a couple of good innings. Had two walks, and I didn't think he had his best stuff. He kept missing up and probably threw more pitches than he should have. I didn't think he was getting his chest down. He stayed up. As a result, the ball stayed up, and fortunately, we lived to tell about it. Bottom of eight, again, it's a 3-2 ball game. Hines rolls over ball to first. Clark singles to left. Cummins flies out to the center, right center, and then Jaeger grounds out to the pitcher. And uh, really nice play there by Gene. That ball was hit pretty well. Might have even got back up the middle. I don't know for sure. But it would have been a competitive play. And, and Gene grabs it and then – Quietly tosses the first. He's very emotional after that play. I don't blame him. It's a great play. All right, so here we go. Here we go. All right, so we, again, in each of Auger's three innings, he ended up walking a hitter, and he walks Williamson on four straight. And then Caden Rose pops up the bunt. You almost wish here in this situation here because the runner froze on the play, and you got to make a play. you got to get an out. You almost wish you just drop it in turn two here. But you take the pop-up and it's done. Um, and so runner holds it first. So basically you're gifted an out here. And so at this point, there's a runner at first, one down. We go get Cam Tower to face all these lefties. He gets Jim Jarvis. Uh, they called it a sag bun. I don't know. That, I don't even know if that's accurate. But um, it seems like he tried to push it by the pitcher here. He was bunning for a hit. And it's difficult to judge intent. And uh, they throw him out. So now there's two outs. We intentionally walk Seidel to get the dent. And if anybody had told you that at the beginning of the week, you know, that we would walk their, um, you know, their leading hitter, their leading home run hitter uh, on the Sunday game, we're going to walk Seidel to get to that guy? Don't know if I would have seen that coming. But he, he burns us here. Denton singles to left field. Really the only big hit he had all weekend, I think. And uh, scores a run, makes it 4-2. And then from here, the wheels kind of fall off for us. Dio Dotti didn't walk this time. He singles through the right side. And then uh, Denton goes to third. Sidell scores. It's 5-2. We bring in Jackson Fristo. He gives up a single to Tamez. Another run is in, makes it 6-2. And then Pickney strikes out swinging. But, again, we talk about the leadoff walk. 
this is when it catches up with you. I mean, I think the statistics are when the leadoff guy gets on in a tie ball game or a one-run ball game in the night, he scores like 671,000% of the time. It just seems like it always happens. And so here we were. We kind of managed the game. We've, we've kind of flirted with disaster the whole ball game. And then it's like, okay, now all of a sudden we've kind of grown accustomed. Oh, we'll just work around it. But we needed a clean inning. We didn't get it. We walked the guy, and he ultimately comes around to score. He wasn't the only one, but if you get him and you get Rose and you get Jarvis, it's a one, two, three inning. And, of course, there's always there's if and thens because if Williamson doesn't walk, of course, Rose isn't trying to bunt, nor is Jarvis. But the reality of it is is you face three hitters, and the one guy you didn't get comes around and scores and gives them a little more of a cushion. Bottom of nine at this point, you're thinking if we come back and, and walk these guys off the ninth inning again, you know, Brad Bohannon may burn down the stadium. Uh, Von Siebert walks t- as a pinch hitter for uh, Lane Forsythe, and then uh, Braylon Skinner goes out and pinch runs. And Braylon always gets a nice ovation when he takes the field, and I'm really glad to see that. I don't know how much he helps us uh, at the plate, but he is a guy that is very beloved by this fan base. It's very good to see. Quarter flies out to right field. James reaches on a fielder's choice. They force Skinner at second. Tried to turn two there. Thought they had him. I thought Cam actually pulled up a little bit going into first. And then he, he takes second. It's defensive indifference there. Uh, and then Hancock flies out the center. The ball game's over. And, uh, you know, he said, hey, we won the series. But, yeah, we wanted to win all three games. And I think this is one of those games, too, we're going to look back at hindsight. Wish we'd had. Just like same thing with the Saturday game of Georgia. Now, Alabama outplayed us yesterday. There's no doubt about it. But then they also made some errors to allow us to stay in the game. We didn't make them pay for it. Great teams make you pay. We didn't do that yesterday. So that's the weekend. And uh, now it's take some time and uh, be kind of looking, looking ahead at Memphis. How about that? So Bulldogs will be back in action at uh, AutoZone Park uh, where the Memphis Redbirds play on Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Let's take a quick look at the Tigers. It has been a, a better year for them. They have uh, they've lost a little bit as of late, but um, non-conference pretty pretty favorable for them. They're eight and five at home, four and three away. Uh, no record on a neutral field at this point. Opened the year with a two out of three series win over Valparaiso. Central Arkansas game was canceled. They win two out of three against Brown. All these games, of course, in Memphis. And then they lose two out of three to Nichols State there in Memphis. And that was not at Redbird Park. That was at Avron Fogelman Field there on the Memphis campus. The Tuesday game against Ole Miss was postponed due to weather. They take uh, three from Sanford. Of course, Sanford loses a lot last year. They do win all three of those games. They take a midweek game on the road at Arkansas State 9-7. Take two out of three to Southern Illinois Edwardsville. They lose the Friday night game, come back to win the other two. The Ole Miss game in AutoZone Park was canceled, and then Wednesday they played at Ole Miss uh, and lose 11-8, to eight, an entertaining ball game to say the least. And then they lose two over the weekend to Indiana State, did not get the full three games in uh, due to weather. They were That was on the road at Terre Haute, Illinois. So they are um, – <clears throat> they are – They've lost three in a row and have had to deal with some weather just like the rest of us. But a good start for them, a good start. Uh, let's see here. After they play us, they'll, uh, they'll get it together with Ole Miss again on Wednesday, which makes it, makes it an interesting weekend, shall we say. It's a five-game week for Memphis. And so they're going to have to kind of you know, be a little selective, I guess you would say, when it comes to pitching because they're going to have to manage five games and cover 45 innings at, at a minimum this week. So we may not see them go deeper into the pen and likely we'll see perhaps some younger relievers. Not sure who's starting yet. Haven't seen an announcement uh, from the Tigers. Don't know if Pico starts for us or Jag does. But we'll probably see a handful of guys out there. Need to win this game. We need to go at least two and two this week, and that's the one I'm, I'm counting. Let's take a quick look at the Tigers uh, from a numbers standpoint. Again, doing a little bit better job this year. Looks like uh, they hadn't done a good job updating the stats, though. How about that? Not a really good uh, deal in that respect. Not keeping things up for the, uh, for the media. But there it is. We find it. You're good friend and host 
is undaunted. All right, so look, from an offensive standpoint, they have four players that are hitting above 300, led by Logan Kohler. Logan Kohler with uh, four doubles, five home runs on the year. The five home runs is a team high. As a team, they've hit 25. Only allowed 17. That's a pretty good number. Uh, 6'2", 200-pound uh, infielder from Little Elm, Elm Texas. 6'2", 200, Logan Kohler wears number 10. Jacob Compton also hitting uh, well above 300, 316 for him. He has four home runs, so that's two guys right there kind of carrying the lion's share. A first baseman, sophomore from Olive Branch, Mississippi, not from too far down the road there. Uh, ben Brooks, a fifth-year senior from Nashville, Tennessee, took advantage of a COVID year from Pope John Paul II High School, 6'191 pounds. Old wins. Uh I guess this is Ian Bibaloni. It's a good baseball name. Also a fifth-year guy from Arlington High School there in Lakeland, Tennessee. 5'11", 168-pound outfielder. So they've got some veterans on this team. Uh, they run the bases decently, 18 of 22. Opponents have attempted 37 stolen bases against them. And Memphis has got them 13 times. Pretty good ratio there, 24 to 37. But, uh, you know, guys are certainly giving them a real challenge. Uh, on the base pass. The uh, the top RBI guy, of course, Jacob Compton with 20, Logan Kohler with 18, Ben Brooks with 14, Zach Wilson, 13 for them. But a fifth-year senior from McKinney, Texas, just hitting 213, but very efficient in what he's done so far. Uh, Chris Wansberg, another guy, and several other guys right there around 10 or 11. Uh, but again, I mentioned the home runs as a team, just 25, but – a couple of guys in that lineup, Calder and Compton, you really got to be careful with, for sure. Running the bases, not overly aggressive. Uh, Bibaloni, four of five for them, uh, which is the most on the team. And then Logan Kohler, three of three. It seems like just about everybody else has got, you know, two or less. But 18 or 22 as a team. Let's take a quick look here, uh, pitching-wise. And, again, some of these guys we're not going to see. Some of these guys, they'll, they'll save for the weekend, that weekend series against – against Tulane. Uh, Dalton Kendrick is a guy with nine appearances and one start. He also has nine save. Is clearly working as their, close, as their closer. He is a six foot six, 211-pound left-hander from Hernando, Mississippi. And his work, the longest he worked was four innings against Nichols. But by and large, it's been one, one I take that back, he went five innings against Indiana State. So maybe perhaps he's being elevated uh, to a, from a you know, reliever to a long reliever or maybe a potential starter. He has one start under his belt. Uh, Blake Wimberly, another guy with nine appearances on the year with a 2.86 ERA, worked a one and two record, uh, no starts to his credit. Uh, Chase Kessinger, that's a name you should be familiar with. Yes, that's right. That's the fighting Kessingers from Oxford, Mississippi. A 6'3 junior right-handed pitcher. The guy that's got nine appearances for them as well and does have the one win also working in relief. Just eight innings pitched. Uh, for him, has allowed one hit per inning, five runs, uh, nine walks against uh, 12 strikeouts. So uh, not exactly impressive numbers, but a guy that's put in some work for them. Logan Rushing, eight appearances for them. He is a freshman from Brighton, Tennessee, a six-foot left-handed pitcher, and also a dual-position guy. will play a little bit in the outfield for him as well. But you know, your guess is as good as mine is who starts tomorrow. You know, looking through all this, you know, uh, Connor Shamblin's a weekend guy. Landon Gartman has pitched on the weekends for him, as is David Warren. Uh, Carson Stinnett, yeah, also from Oxford. That's right. Fifth-year guy, right-handed pitcher, 6'3". Might see him. He threw five innings against Valpo and then uh, one and two-thirds against Brown. So we may see him. We'll see how things go. But uh, obviously, you know, some connections. A lot of guys from Mississippi uh, that have played here. You know, other guys that uh, are from our home state that uh, have played against some of our players. But, uh, you know, really could be a Johnny Holstaff day tomorrow, just not exactly sure. You know, Dalton Fowler, of course, I mentioned, it's a guy that's got, uh, you know, six starts in them from South Haven. They've got some big jokers. They really do. And uh, Show and Rock, that's a guy that uh, liked the bigger pitcher. It, it's a little shorter distance from uh, their hand to home plate when you've got greater length. So, as a staff, not exactly outstanding. 4.78 with the ERA, a whip of 1.48, 12 and 8 on the year, of course. Uh, one shutout on the year, so we'll probably score some runs. Five save, 175 innings pitched. 
Uh, the leading inning guy for them is Dalton Fowler, of course, and he is a guy that, that we don't expect to see. Well, he and Connor Shamblin both right there together. Fowler, of course, 25 hits. It's a lot of hits. It's an hit, that's for a starter, that's a lot of hits per inning. Uh, 119 runs, 93 of them earned as a staff. 98 walks against 202 strikeouts. So there is some swing and miss with this staff. They've allowed 17 home runs, uh, five triples. Opponents are hitting just 248 against them. They do have 34 wild pitches, which seems to be a lot. But this next number will jump off the page at you. 28 while hit by pitches. Blake Wimberly, no relation to Jake, so we can pump the brakes there, has seven of those 28. Uh, but, yeah, you know, solid team. We're going to have to go out there and play. We're not going to be able to just go show up, and they're going to be you know, intimidated you know, by the, uh, the M over S. It's not going to happen. But uh, looking at what happened over the weekend, they did not swing the bats well at all uh, against Indiana State. Not much at all. In, uh, in the first game, just four hits and 31 at-bats. Game two, just two hits and 26 at-bats. So not really getting it done at the plate here as of late. Now, against uh, Ole Miss, the uh, former number one, it's ridiculous. Uh, they had nine hits and eight runs against those guys and lose that ball game 11-8. to eight. So they're not going to be intimidated by SEC pitching. Uh, not that we should consider Ole Miss a great pitching staff, but they are a team that can swing it pretty well, even though they didn't over the weekend. Uh, more on that later. But there is a lot of swing and miss in this Memphis lineup. Uh, we're going to have to go play, though. Simple as that. We're going to have to show up and bring our best effort to ensure that uh, we avoid a midweek loss. Got to have this one. I know we talk about, well, you know, it's too early for a, uh, a must-win game, and a midweek should never be a must-win game. We can't afford to take any more non-conference losses. We've got to get a W on Tuesday, and that should be our focus. Final segment of the show brought to you by Portico. You love the folks at Portico, and so do I. Great people doing a great job bringing a great residential development to our great community here in Starkville. Brooks Bryan, my friend Brooks Bryan, saw him over the weekend. He was at Duty Noble Field, which should be no surprise. Usually the Bulldogs are playing, and it's within a reasonable driving distance. Brooks Bryan is there. If you follow Brooks' lead, you could have a place here in Starkville too. Have somewhere to lay your head. Maybe you should, whether it's your ball game weekend retreat or perhaps your retirement home or – Better yet, your primary residence. Move to Starkville and come be my neighbor. We're glad to have you. Phase one completely sold out. Phase two under development. Now you can have a say in that, picking out your lot and your house plans. Be sure and give them an opportunity to serve you. And here's the deal. It's very easy to get to. You turn off 82 on a 12 like going to campus. The very first ride is Pat Station Road. Next thing you know, there you are, Portico. 1.1 miles away. From God's country. That's the Mississippi State campus. Give Brooks a call today for more information. 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. Let's take a quick look around the Southeastern Conference of the weekend it was. We open up with uh, the three-game sweep of the Ole Miss Rebels by Tennessee. Uh, I expected Tennessee to win the series. I didn't know that they would get a sweep. It's difficult to sweep in the SEC especially on the road. But Tennessee goes in. It is a huge win. They rise to number one in the country, a very well-deserved ranking. Uh, beat easily one of the most overranked teams in the country. I'm not just saying that because I'm a Mississippi State guy. This Ole Miss team is going to struggle with pitching most of the year. And teams that can pitch and can match them a little bit offensively are going to defeat them. Uh, Ole Miss did not do a good job. I actually thought that the one game that I watched was the Saturday game. The Elliott kid that came in to mop up, I thought I actually did a pretty good job saving some arms for Sunday, which made that game a lot more competitive. But Tennessee, a real statement weekend nationally, not just in the SEC, but nationally to say, hey, we are for real. And this is a team that lost a ton. They did. Good job by Tony Vitello working the junior college ranks. They're now 23-1 and one, and uh, currently – the only undefeated team within conference play in the Southeastern Conference. Vanderbilt. And I told you guys at the beginning of the year, I didn't get the Vanderbilt love. I still don't. And your good friend and host uh, looking pretty good after uh, the weekend. I don't think this is the last uh, time we talk about this. So South Carolina takes two of three from Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt absolutely destroys them 10 nothing on Friday. They battle back and they only score eight more runs the rest of the weekend. So South Carolina takes two out of three, a huge win series-wise for the Gamecocks. And that's a staff that's pretty embattled. 
going to be awfully interesting. Coming up this weekend, Vanderbilt will head to Knoxville. And again, I think that's going to be a statement weekend for Tennessee. I don't think they sweep them, but if they do, Katie barred the door. All right, the Georgia Bulldogs, our friends out in Athens, uh, kind of a tough weekend for them. You know, it's uh, you know they, they took two out of three from us, but let's be honest, we kind of gifted them one. They travel to Kentucky. They win the first game on Friday, then lose the next two, and Kentucky offensively really beat up Georgia pitching. Uh, that Sunday game, 18-5, to Kentucky really just kind of took them uh, to the woodshed there. So 18-5 to winners. Kentucky takes a series, uh, best two out of three. Missouri, our friends at Mizzou, you know, we love those guys so much. Uh, the guys at Mizzou that came in here and, and smacked us around a little bit, they take one from Arkansas over the weekend. And that's big. You, know, you don't expect them to take the series, but you just need some people to pick off some of that traffic ahead of us. And so they win the Saturday game 7-5. to five. Arkansas uh, scores 14 runs on the weekend. So, you know, we'll see what happens offensively with Arkansas. But, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good get for Mizzou. But I think we all know Mizzou is probably, you know, that staff likely on the way out without a, a good run here. Let's look at the SEC West. We've already touched on Arkansas. Auburn, the Tigers, working to make something out of the season. You know, they, they had a chance to take two out of three from Ole Miss, and then the bullpen absolutely collapses. Those scores were ridiculous. You know, Ole Miss 13-6, Auburn 19-5, that Ole Miss 15-2. You're going to see a lot of that this year with both of these teams. But Auburn takes two of three on the road at A&M. A lot of people were looking at A&M and saying, hey, you know, they knocked LSU around a little bit. Maybe this is it. But Auburn goes over there and does a really nice job uh, to take two of three. And, again, a lot of parity in the league this year, which I think helps us. I really do. We don't need several teams to kind of run off. You know, if Tennessee runs away with it, I guess that's part of the deal, and everybody else can beat each other up, which kind of keeps us in contention, I think, for a potential host spot if we can win some games. Right now, I don't have us hosting. But when you look at all this parity in the league, it kind of opens up some opportunities for you. Uh, the LSU Tigers, impressive this weekend against the University of Florida. I expected Florida to win the series. I thought it would be competitive. It really wasn't. Florida went 7-2 to on Friday, and then LSU absolutely smashes Florida in Saturday and Sunday's games, 16-4 and 11-2. Those games not competitive in the least. And so LSU, of course, uh, that's going to be an interesting team. They will be at Duty Noble Field here before you know it. They'll be with us uh, the first full weekend of April, April 8th, 9th, and 10th. So I guess it's the second full weekend. They're going to they're gonna take on Auburn uh, this weekend. And then we'll travel uh, to Mississippi State before they go to Arkansas. So LSU, going to see you know an Auburn team that's playing pretty well and then come to Duty Noble Field and head to Bomb Stadium. When you get through that, you feel pretty good about your schedule if you're LSU. You do. I mean, the, the meat of their schedule, their conference schedule, is, is coming up here within the next month. So – uh, looking at the standings, always important to keep an eye on the standings. Even though winning the SEC is not – that's always a nice goal because the SEC champion's always a uh, top eight NAFL seed. We just want to be able to host the first two rounds at home, and if we get the SEC championship, uh, then that's all the better. But uh, not really in contention, I don't think, this year to win the overall crown. Already three games out of first, just two weekends in. And uh, Tennessee – played in the East, I think has a chance to really run away with this thing if they can remain healthy, and they're about to get some pitching back. So Tennessee 6-0 and uh, over there in the East, Vandy 4-2, and Georgia 3-3, three and three, Florida 3-3, three and three, Kentucky 2-4, and four, South Carolina 2-4, and four, and Missouri 1-5. and five. So there's two, te- two teams in the East and just three teams overall with a better SEC record than your Mississippi State Bulldogs. You may not have realized that, but that's the reality of it. Arkansas 5-1. We got a chance to go up there and uh, and have some say in that. Auburn's three and three, LSU three and three, A and M three and three, Mississippi State three and three, and then Ole Miss, Alabama, two and four. So interesting f- first two weeks. You could take a snapshot of this right now, especially these teams in the middle of the pack, and look back at the end of the year, and things are going to be a lot different. I think the one thing we can look at and say, the SEC West is going to be as competitive as always. Absolutely as competitive as it always. And then Kentucky seems to be playing better. It's a big series win for them. I told you guys I thought Georgia was a good team that plays clean, 
They don't make a lot of mistakes. They're not a team that actually wows you from an athletic standpoint. They're not just a great offense, but they're going to be a good offense. I think they're going to be a team that really contends to potentially host. But losing to Kentucky, that was not a step in that direction. Yeah, so we'll see how things go. But uh, that's where we are right now. Pretty, I can't say I'm excited about where we are right now, but I'm not panicking by any stretch. You know, we, we talked about, you know, after you know, we got off a little bit of a rough start there, we dro- you know, dropped that game against Northern Kentucky. I mean, that's just, that's just one you look at. And you say, you know, we're going to be chasing that bad loss the rest of the year. But let's look at what's happened here, you know, the last couple of weeks. You know, uh, we had the, you know, the week where we come off the two-lane series. We, we lost and we blew the game on Saturday. Saturdays have been difficult for Mississippi State. But then you split the midweek deal with Texas Tech, and then you win, you sweep the series with Princeton. That gives you a four-in-one week. You know, the next week, you take Binghamton, you get one at Georgia, it's a two-and-two week. And then this past week, it's a three-and-one week. So you got to avoid losing weeks, but you go back and you begin to look, start piecing this thing together. You know, the Saturday game at Georgia that the bullpen blew, the Saturday game at Tulane the bullpen blew, uh, the Friday game against Southern Kentucky where we couldn't get the bats going. Uh, same thing with that first game against Long Beach State. Even though that's a 3 ball game, I tip my cap to those guys. But you look back, the Northern Kentucky game, and Southern Miss just beat us. But Northern Kentucky and then those two Saturday games, you change those things, and it's a completely different scenario right now. And, but that's, that's the difference between hosting and not hosting. So State, again, on the road for four games this week. I will be in Memphis uh, covering the game, and then we'll come back and uh, – and record your show Wednesday morning, then I'll be in Fayetteville this weekend. I will be wherever the dogs are whenever I can make it. Uh, so looking forward to some road trips this week, and then we'll be back at Duty Noble Field uh, a week from tomorrow against UT Martin. That is a 7 p.m. first, excuse me, 6 p.m. first pitch uh, for the Bulldogs, and then we'll welcome our friends from Ellis Shooter Town. So four on the road this week, and then we put together a nice little homestand. Uh, we'll have two weeks of uh, four-week games, all of those at home. And then the next week, we play Jackson State before heading to Oxford. So uh, a nine-game homestand coming up once we get through this. And so hopefully you'll have an opportunity uh, to head out to Duty Noble Field and cheer on the Diamond Dogs uh, to victory. I want to thank everybody involved with the dogpile.com operation, dogpiledbook.com operation. A lot of orders here as of late. Again, let me bring you up to date about – 300 copies of Flim Flam are left. If you hadn't got it, you need to get it. If you want to get one for your smart aleck Ole Miss brother-in-law, I'm happy to sign it to him too. And then uh, let's see, about 200-plus copies of Alpha Dogs and uh, less, let's see, about 100 Stark Villains and then less than 100 Dogpile at the dogpilethebook.com website. So if you've kind of put off getting this and say, hey, Steve, I don't like the pre-order. I like to order it and get it in a few days. Now's the time to do that. And uh, after that, we're going to be farming you out to stores because it's probably going to be, you know, a few weeks before we have other inventory. So if you're looking for dog pile, now's the time to order. You can get that taken care of. And then, uh, you know, orders have slowed down a little bit because people are buying them in stores. So if you need personalization, either come to a book signing or, of course, order through dogpilethebook.com. Get a lot of comments, too, about my Stark Villains gear when I wear it. You can find it, too, at starkvillains.com. Starkvillains.com, get t-shirt, hoodies, all sorts of things there in a variety of colors. And, uh, you know, with summertime coming up, maybe it's time that you upgraded to a Stark Villains t-shirt. You'd be glad you did. It's awfully, awfully cool. All right, and, and again, it's so good to see everybody this weekend. And uh, I got some, uh, some signings coming up. I will be, let me see, this, this weekend I will be signing in the natural state in case you guys are unfamiliar with that. So we'll do something with the Mississippi State Alumni Association this weekend. That will be a Saturday deal. That will be, let's see here, Saturday, April the 2nd, from noon to 3 at Farrell's on West Dixon Street there in Fayetteville, Arkansas. You got that? Saturday, that's the only signing this week in Arkansas. Next Saturday, I'll be at April 9th, I'll be at the Lodge from 10 to 1230. And then Monday, April 11th, we'll make the trip to Newton, Mississippi with the Alumni Association. So Newton, that's a six to eight deal Monday. So go ahead and mark your calendar. So just uh, three signings here in the next couple of weeks. 
And then uh, I've got a big one coming up, too. I'm going to do a big event down and do a, a watch party deal at Hobie's on Main uh, here in a couple weeks, few weeks. So we'll, we'll give you more details on that. So be thinking about that. So if you're going to be, if you're in Northwest Arkansas or going to the game and you haven't got a copy of Dogpile and you'd like to get one, get one signed personally, uh, you can meet me at Farrell's or Farrell's. I don't know which how they're pronouncing it, at West Dixon Street, Fayetteville, Arkansas, noon to 3 before the Bulldogs take on the Razorbacks out there at Bomb Stadium. That's going to do it for today. Thanks so much for all your support and your patronage over the years. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we'll make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance and more, and GEICO is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com or contact your local agent today.